Man, happy birthday, man. <laughs> so thankful to have uh, 10, 10 years with all of you. You guys have been such a, a great church and uh, an inspiration, and you've done a lot of good things in 10 years. I want you to know that. So whether it was making weekend services happen, whether it was funding something, resourcing something, uh, you know, lo looking back uh, yesterday, I spent just uh, an hour or so just thinking about the past 10 years, and um, there's no doubt that COVID was a very, very difficult year. We were not prepared for it. We weren't prepared to do church online, and uh, we weren't prepared to try and keep people together. Yeah, something just fell over there. Um, we weren't prepared to try and keep people together, um, but you stayed with us, and you gave us grace, and um, you helped us financially. Uh, we weren't here to talk about giving and resourcing and offering, but that didn't keep you know things being due, and you just were so faithful. And so over the years, man, we have, we've had the privilege of baptizing so many people and doing so many groups and having so many weekends together. And I'm just thankful for this fam family of faith. And so happy birthday to all of you. Thank you for 10 incredible, incredible years. And so today I am in part two of a series this series is called Rooted, and I wanted to take a moment. Our, our publishing, our internal publishing put this together. This is a study guide on this series called Rooted. And um, I believe you can order this through Amazon. This book is five bucks. The unfortunate part is our series is only three weeks long. This book is seven weeks and um, but this this was written by our campus pastors, put together by our creative team, and it's really really good and well done. So these are five bucks. It cost uh, that's what it costs to have it made. This isn't a money maker. I've got twenty here today. And so what I want you to do at the end of service, I'm just going to spread them out here. You can take one. You can throw five bucks in the offering. If you don't have five bucks, take it anyway, okay? The point is to get it to you. So just come up, grab one. Um, we're just, you know, if you got five bucks, you got it. If you don't, you don't. We want to put it into your hands. And then you can order one directly from Amazon. Again, I don't, do we have that, that link? Maybe, maybe not. Um, but you can um, order that directly and get it to you. It's really, really solid. So I ask you to uh, bring your physical Bible this year. I want to just uh, explain that for just a second. This is, um, you know, a very brief time that we get together. And even though we are big tech people, I mean, I'm preaching from a MacBook today. Um, but even though we're, we're big tech people around here, um, we want this to be a, an hour of just uninterrupted focus. And I think kind of putting our phones to the side, opening our Bible, putting it in our lap, grabbing a, a, a pen, being tactile for the hour um, can really help us to just maximize our time together. This isn't anything other than, than that. I just want us to revisit and come back to the point of simplicity and focus, and I think this helps do it. And so again, as Craig said, if you don't have one, please tell us, okay, because we want to get one into your hand. There's no shame in it, and uh, you can bring any Bible that, that you want. Um, you know, we had a guy uh, growing up, he brought his grandmother's coffee table Bible, you know, that, that big one that's like, like you know, he, he would bring that to church, you know, he's a super Christian. And so um, if, if you want to bring that, you can, but um, we are in a series on Rooted. And so last week we talked about shallow roots. We talked about what it means uh, to have things of strength and greatness and the ability to lose that just by being shallow, uh, by having um, a, a lack of depth in our lives. There are a lot of people who come to a point of being saved by grace through faith um, and they are are on, on a journey, but they, 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 they never take depth. They, they never become a, a follower of Christ. It is a point of forgiveness, repentance, but they never go on a journey of depth. And so that's kind of what we talked about last week, making sure that our roots are indeed deep. Today, I'm going to talk about a, a tough topic, one that is applicable to every single person in the building. Um, but it's just hard content because it's so truthful. And sometimes truth has a little sting to it. And so today you may feel that some. But today I'm going to talk about a bitter root 
It's what um, the Bible even calls poisonous fruit. And so it comes from a place of bitterness. We're going to take our main text from Hebrews chapter 12. So if you would, uh, go there with me in, in your Bible. And uh, we're also going to show that to you on, on the screen. I'll ask you today to leave scriptures up as long as possible. Uh, since I'm asking people to turn to their physical Bible and take notes, I want those up as long as possible. So Hebrews chapter 12, 14 and 15 is going to be where we take the most meat from today. This is what it says. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God, meaning that it's extended. See to it that no one falls short of that grace. Give it away, all right? And then he goes on and says, and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Let's read that last part again. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Bitterness is always looking for a way to get into our lives. When you experience disappointment, or hurt, or you've been treated unfairly, or you have been lied about, it hurts. And if you don't deal with that well, then bitterness has an opportunity to create a well in your life, a well that holds your hurts, right? So I want you to think internally about a cistern in your life that is able to just hold on to the hurt that you have. And throughout your lifespan, as you're hurt, you collect that into a bucket and you dump it into that cistern over and over and over again until it becomes a well in your life that you can actually pull from. I think most of us have lived long enough to get at least a taste of bitterness I had a friend in second grade by the name of Sam. He stole my girlfriend. I was very angry about that. He grew up to become a Navy SEAL, so I've let it go. But things can start early, right? A lot of us can recall growing up. Maybe you grew up in a home that wasn't very peaceful. Maybe it was hurtful. Maybe you've carried some words that were spoken over you for a long time. And you've created this well in your life, and that's where you keep the memory of those words. It's a bitter root. It's something that can grow through your emotions, affect your relationships, affect the way you see God and, and the uh, church. And so social scientists are now saying that 70% of us are actively holding on to a grievance. Like if we ask you, is there someone in the world right now that you would secretly celebrate them falling? Do you have that person? 70% of people would say, I've got somebody that I hold something against. Maybe you were passed up. Athletics, at work. Your talent wasn't noticed. Maybe your heart was broken. Maybe it was broken as a teen or 20s or after 20 years of marriage, but your heart was broken. But there are really hard things in this life that become uh, big points of temptation for bitterness. Family hurt is one of the biggest. This is when your safe space becomes a battleground. It's when things get said or done around the people that you love in life the most, and some of those things unfortunately become irreparable. You have betrayal. Betrayal from a spouse. Betrayal from a friend. And suddenly, loyalty that you thought was present for a lifetime vaporizes before you. Trust erodes 
things fall apart, even if apologies are said, when there's not healing salve placed on that, you can develop a sense of bitterness about that person or about that circumstance that stays with you an entire lifespan. These experiences produce a bitter root, which produces a bitter fruit, and the Bible calls it poisonous. It's harmful to you. It's harmful to how you relate to other people. It's harmful for how you raise your children with a bitter root inside of you. It's harmful how we come together in a church and we attempt to worship God in holiness while holding on and harboring things. In Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 18, he says, I am making this covenant with you so that no one among you will turn away from the Lord our God and so that no root among you bears bitter and poisonous fruit. So God is saying, I'm going to make a covenant with you so that you can have something in your life that is stable and solid and predictable and unmovable. Because there's going to be a lot of things in your life that are like that. But I'm not going to be one of them. He says, I want to give you a covenant. I want to create something that doesn't move. So that there is no bitterness inside of your heart and poisonous fruit that can come up. A bitter root is terrible. It's actually why Cain kills his brother. It's out of rejection. Like the feeling that God loves him more than he loves me. And so I've been rejected, and then he, he murders him. It's terrible bitterness. Joseph's brothers sell him into slavery because he shares his dream with them. So I will be honest here. This is, is, is a side sermon. Be careful who you share your dream with. Okay? Not everyone is happy that God is blessing you. So be careful there. But Joseph's brothers become so jealous of his story, of the favor that is on his life, that they become bitter and they say, we're going to sell you off. And that thing that you've got with our dad where he likes you the most, we're going to tell him you're dead. All because of bitterness. Absalom kills his own brother, Amnon, out of anger. He's so bitter about what happened that he kills him. Bitterness in its worst form evolves into something that we were not even allowed to talk about in our home growing up, and that was the word hate. Our parents would not allow us to say, I hate something. It was just looked at like a terrible word. You did not say that you hated a person or you hated a thing. You were allowed to say dislike, I disagree, but you could not say, I hate that. I hate them. It was just something that you didn't do. And hatred is the evolution of bitterness. It becomes the end game. It is the accomplice to every murder that you can talk about is bitterness turning into hatred and hatred becoming an action. Hatred can wield a weapon. It can murder a marriage. It can fell a friendship. And I'm being sensitive here, but people, some people who are experiencing suicidal thoughts are in a state of hatred that they have aimed toward themselves. Like they've got such negative self-talk. I hate you. I hate who you are. I hate our life. I hate what you've become. I hate what you did. This is all your fault. And those thoughts build and build and build until they become what seems to be unbearable. It's bitterness turning in to hatred. I don't know if you've ever seen that show Alone. Anybody ever ever watched that? I don't think it's even like, uh, okay, there's only one of us, so I'll talk to you. Yeah, right there. Alone used to be one of my favorite shows. They would they would drop you off in the middle of nowhere alone, and you had to just survive it. And you had a satellite phone, I think, and and you could, if you used it for any reason, like if you called your mom, it was over. If you called for help, you 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 ended the the, the show. You 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 were done. And there was one guy one season who was dropped off 
Two hours later, the sun sets. He hears a bear in the woods, and he's out. Hours later. I've, I've never felt so connected with someone on TV <laughs> like that guy. You know, that would have been me. Me with a satellite phone. Robbie, it's over. I'm coming home. I don't care about the million dollars. I heard a bear in the woods. Okay? So I'm coming home. And... One thing you learn from that show or any show like that that's outdoors is if you see a wolf, you are probably surrounded because a wolf does not travel alone. It hunts in packs and they're very strategic and they're very angry and they're very hungry. They, they're not there to make friends. They travel in a pack, and bitterness, unfortunately, comes the same way. So you think you may be dealing with one little bitter thought, but be careful because bitterness has best friends. Now, Ephesians points this out to us. Ephesians 4 and 31, Paul writes, and I, I'm going to go slow here because I want you to see this whole thing. He says, let all bitterness, okay, there's the leader of, of, of the pack right there, the main wolf. And then he starts to list them off. And wrath, and anger, and clamor. Okay, now clamor is normally a word we don't use, but it basically means this, a confusing noise. Like there's something in your life that's just, you know, that, like, like that movie Dumb and Dumber when he says, hey, do you want to hear the most annoying noise? In the ah! You know, it's, it's like that. You, you, you're like, man, that is so annoying. He says, take clamor and slander and put it away from you. And then he remembers one, one more wolf. And he says, oh, and along with all malice. Malice is this. It's intentional harm. It's first degree harm premeditated. I've thought about a way that I, I can hurt you. I have put together this incredible post for Facebook and I'm going to hit enter and watch this thing work. That's malice. He says, I want you to do away with all of that. The entire pack. Not just bitterness, not just one thought, not just the one thing. You got to get rid of all of it that comes with it. And so I want you to write these things down because I'm going to spend the rest of my time giving you three areas to start looking for bitter fruit in your life. The first one is the most obvious. It's from our mouths. When we're bitter, when we're bitter we talk trash. We have an opportunity. Now, we disguise it as requests for prayer. Or we say, hey, you know, I don't know if you heard, but I'm really concerned. And then we follow it with this. And we lie to ourselves and we, we act like we're saying we, we really want the best here because they're obviously in, in bad. But what you want to do is cast shadow. It's from our mouths. Luke chapter 6 verse 45 says, A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. There's a pattern there. Good, good, good. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil that he has stored up. Evil, evil, evil. For the mouth will speak what the heart is full of. And a man of that is not a scary verse. Right? Can I get an amen? amen? So what we're talking about, what we're pouring out, what we're engaging other people with is a reflection of what's going, it's, you're telling all about what is going on inside of you because from your mouth, your heart is speaking out loud. So Jesus is saying this, that my words and your words are a great thermometer to what's happening in your heart. And it's really sad sometimes for all of us because we've all fallen into this trap. We can have it together in almost every area of our lives. Your finances can be in order. Your marriage can be healthy. 
Your body can be healthy. You can be working on you. And suddenly, the right moment, the right opportunity can trigger that well that is in your life that has not been dealt with. And from that, it begins to just scoop out and pour out of your mouth into the physical world, into the ears of other people. And everyone sees as you expose what you're really about when it comes to that circumstance. Like all of you, I have had some tough life experiences. I've had a season or two in my life where I have certainly had bitterness in my heart, not just in my head. I have had a well of bitterness in my life before. Without realizing it, my speech changes. Why? Because my heart becomes bitter. My mindset changes. The way I view my life, my friendships, my family, the church, the way you might even perceive God at a certain time. Your compassion level or tolerance for others can dip as you become bitter. You don't care as much because you're calloused in that area. You're hard toward it. You don't want to repent toward it. It is something that's very difficult and challenging for you. I have had my wife confront me in these areas and go, hey, I don't know what's going on here, but we all see it and we all feel it. And as, as a man who's trying to be godly, that hurts. When your wife becomes your surgeon and sees what's going on from a different perspective and says, hey, I think you've got some bitterness in your life that you've got to deal with. It's not fun. A little bitterness poisons the whole well of your heart. And it's awful for me because I want, in, in all honesty, I want to be a godly man and a good father and I, I want to be a good husband. I, I want my, my father is here today. He's 80 years old. He is the best man that I know in the world. And in 30 years from now, I want to be just like him. This is the truth of my life. But there are potholes along the way that I've fallen into. I have baptized people while being bitter in my heart. Not, not at them, but just in general towards something. I've had to come to the pulpit and speak the word of God and have something in my life that's just not firing in terms of bitterness. I think we've, we've all been there. I remember one time being in a, in a counseling session with a couple. And the man said, it, it started to get really heated and I always like that. I always like because I feel like now, now we're getting you know, down to it. And he said, she thinks I'm stupid. And I said, how do you know that? He said, because she told me. <laughs> That's a poisonous well. <laughs> okay, Pretty good indicator that from the abundance of her heart, her mouth did speak. <laughs> Second thing, are you watching reruns? Okay. Kids don't even know what a rerun is anymore. But if you're my age, you know what it is. It's Thursday night. You got a bean bag on the floor and Totino's pizza rolls. <laughs> we would watch repeats of the Dukes of Hazard. Because there was no such thing as Netflix. You can always tell if you have something in your heart to deal with by how many times you replay it in your head. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I'm going to ask you out loud, and then you're going to ask yourself, how many of you are overthinkers? All right? Like, like, like you, you overthink it. And then, then you think it again. And, and, and again. And the first time you told yourself, it might have been kind of on the truth, but by the time you've played that 50 times, you're bending it in, in a way that is untrue. And now your emotions are involved, and now bitterness is involved, and now that pack of wolves is in, is in your life, and now it's affecting you physiologically. You can be so bitter, it affects your blood pressure. You can be so upset and bitter that you are anxious, that you are losing sleep. 
Because that pack of wolves is just running through your life and running through the scenarios and running through what you'd like to do. All of a sudden, that same spirit that drove Cain and Joseph's brothers and Absalom are in your life. And I'm not saying that you're thinking about murder, but I'm saying you're thinking about malice. Like, wouldn't it be great if, and then you've got this scenario playing out of what, what would happen. John Acuff calls this in his book, he calls it a soundtrack. Like, and if you don't remember what a soundtrack is, a lot of people used to sing in church using a soundtrack. They would put it on, it'd be like the music, and it'd sound like a full band behind them, and then they would sing over it. Now, relate that to your thoughts. It's like, you can think over it, you can work over it, you can be married over it, you can have a lot of things going over it, but some in, in the background. It's just the background music playing over and over and over and over again, a soundtrack in our lives. And Paul is saying, man, this is an old problem. So Paul is saying, listen, if you let that get in your heart, it's going to be so hard to follow Jesus. Do not let your roots become bitter. We talked last week about protecting your roots, and I'll say it again. Guard your roots. We protect the things we love. We protect the things that we value the most. Some of you in this place, you have gun cabinets. Why? Because you have not only expensive guns, but you have sentiment. You have things that belong to your father and your grandfather and his father before him, and those things have been handed down, and you put them up, and you lock them away, and you want them taken care of. Why? Because they're valuable to you. Some of you built homes with safe rooms. Why? Because we live in Tornado Alley. These things happen. Some of you were smart. What, what do we do? We get in the bathtub and throw couch cushions over ourselves like we think that's going to help. Why? Because we want to protect the people we love. I don't know if you know this, but the Constitution is under bulletproof glass inside a titanium case, shielded from harmful light, guarded 24 hours a day. Why? Because there's still a group of people in this country who find it to be valuable. Proverbs 4, 23 says, Above all else... I've preached that verse to you many times because he's, he's on a rant about wisdom. And we do this, and we do this, and we do this, and this, and don't, don't forget about this. And then he says, but above all else, above all that I've said, guard your heart. Because everything you do is going to come from there. And if that's damaged, if it's bitter, if it's loaded with all these wolves, then everything you do is going to come from that lens. You're going to live from that place. Third, and this is a hard one, okay? If, if out of the three, there's one that's got more cold water, it's, it's this one. Are the people around you bitter? Because sometimes when you're bitter, you accidentally start a life group that's bitter. Like you come together, and, and here's what happens. You become the people who are really, really in need of grace, like you get that you're messed up and your life's messed up and you haven't always done the right thing and you've had some missteps, but you don't want to give grace to anybody else. Like you want it, but you don't want to give it. And you live life with people like that. Are the people around you bitter? Bitterness loves company. Again, it travels in a pack. It is a reflection. A lot of times our, our relationships are a reflection of our own values and worldviews. We tend to be closest to those that believe and see the world the way we do. I don't know if you've ever noticed how a gang operates, but if one person is mad, they're all mad. It's part of the loyalty of that group. You got a problem with somebody? Then I got a problem with them. If, everyone's at, if somebody's at ease, then they're, they all are at ease. So we're good, everybody's good, okay? They wait on a cue from one person to put the whole group into motion. And oftentimes, this is how bitterness works in our lives, even in churches. And I hate talking about this part of it in this message, but it's true, is that we let this sometimes get into church People will walk away from a group that they do life with and worship with and serve God with because they are bitter. 
And they got a wolf pack driving their life. I've often told you I've been in church my whole life. I'm the definition of a church boy. I've been in it my whole life. And the unfortunate part about that is you see all the great and all of the ugly. It's just like Noah's Ark. It's great. We're all alive, but it stinks sometimes, you know. And it hurts. The church is notorious for unintentionally hurting each other. We don't mean it, but it happens. And it's still dealing with it in a godly way and getting it out and getting it cured and getting it healed. People run and they let that wolf pack get in them and they start to talk and they run their mouth and they do nasty things. Why? Because that's what wolves do. They're being driven by an old spirit that's been around forever. Hebrews 12, let's look at it again. This is where where we started. I'm going to start to land this in just a second. Hebrews 12, 15, he says, See to it that no one, everybody say no one, falls short of the grace of God. Meaning this, man, we all need it, don't we? We all need it, don't we? Let's try it again because that was about 20% of you. We all need it, don't we? We all need grace. So let's receive it and then let's give it away. Because he says in verse 15, if you got that shiny new highlighter that we, put, that we gave you, I want you to take it out and I want you to highlight this part. That no bitter root grows up to cause trouble. And then this is the awful part. And defile many. Don't, don't, don't let it grow up and sabotage your family. Don't let it grow up and start a generational something in your family that goes on and on and on and on. We've seen those generational hurts in our country go on and on and on. And there are people groups who do not like each other and don't even know why. My sister and I, who was also, she was a pastor, we had a conflict one time and Early in, in our lives, I was in my early 20s. She was just four years ahead of us, so we were both in our 20s. Later in life, we started to talk about that. And this was the conclusion. We had no idea why we were even upset. We just knew that we were. Now tell me that's not how Satan would work, Right? I'm mad at you. Why? I don't even know anymore. I just am. That's bitterness, man. That's a root that grew up and just defiled. That robbed you of incredible moments. So when you're looking for a fruit of bitterness in your life, we may want to take a look at the people around us. I don't want to pass bitterness on to my spouse and I'm not talking about sharing hard times, because you will. I'm not talking about sharing conflict, but I'm talking about shared bitterness. I'm mad at somebody, and now I want you to be mad at that same somebody. It used to burn me up when I'd share something like, like, like that with Robbie, and she was like, oh, that's unfortunate, because I love them. And I'd be like, you better get on my team. I don't want to raise a bitter child. Can somebody say amen? amen? Bitterness can break up a lot of things. And Paul teaches us in Ephesians, and here, here it comes. Here's the remedy. Here's what we waited on. Ephesians 4.32, you all know it because you had a childhood song to it. It says, be kind to one another and tenderhearted. And forgive each other. And it's almost like somebody is in the, in the crowd while he's teaching this. Why would I do that? Because God in Christ forgave you. Because you needed it. Now they need it. And he wants you 
to extend that through you to them. Now watch this. Kevin, that doesn't feel good because you don't know what they did and you don't know what they said and you don't know the attitude that they carry. And our city is small and I see them in Walmart and I see them in TJ Maxx and I see them at Colton's and their attitude is all... You, you don't know that. You know, don't, don't tell me to be kind to them and tender-hearted and forgiving. It doesn't feel good. I will join you. You are right. It does not feel good sometimes to be kind and tender-hearted and forgiving. It doesn't include that. It just says to do it. Right? When I was a kid, my mom used to make me eat English peas. She's been gone seven years. I still resent her for it. <laughs> she said, just, just eat them. Just do it. You don't have to be happy about it. Just eat it. Same thing. Just do it. We don't have to be happy. It doesn't have to make us happy and be fulfilled and joyous. And You don't have to feel like you're serving God when you do it. Just do it. Just forgive it. Just grace it. Because watch this. If that doesn't feel good, if tenderness doesn't feel good and forgiving them and, and being kind to them doesn't feel good, guess what else doesn't feel good? The pack of wolves living in your life neither feel good. But one is going to lead to healing and one is going to lead to hatred. So pick your path and sacrifice now because both of them don't feel good. So let one of them take you on to health because the other one leads to hatred. Let me close with this. Bitterness obviously happens a lot in Scripture. In Exodus, those people were very stubborn. The people of God are having a worship service in Exodus. And they're singing, they're talking about how grateful they are to be delivered out of Egypt. And they're singing, they're writing songs and they're celebrating the goodness of God. And Exodus 15, 23 says, and they come to this, this oasis. Okay, it's a place with water. And they're going to drink. And it says that the water was too bitter to drink. So they called the place Mara, okay, which means bitter. So they said, you know, the, the, this oasis is Mara. It's, it's bitter. So they pull up to this little creek to get a drink. The water is bitter. I'm just guessing here, probably tastes like an avocado smoothie. And so they can't drink it. They're like, I'm done with that. That thing went from revival to rebellion. Like that. From remembering all that God had done to complaining about what he hasn't. And in Exodus 15, Moses is so distraught, he cries out to the Lord for help. And he says, hey, we, we need some help here. And it says, so Moses cried out and the Lord showed him a piece of wood and Moses threw it into the water and, and this made the water good for, for, for drinking. Obviously, this is a type and shadow. Some translations say that God showed Moses a fallen tree and told him to put it into the water. And the pools of Mara, it says, become sweet and good for drinking. Again, an incredible type and shadow of Jesus Christ. So let, let me end, end with this. For every situation... For every time someone has lied about you or misunderstood you or said that you tried to hurt them and you did not, for every time something broke in your life that you didn't ask for, for every time someone looked at you and projected their own stuff onto your life, and you just became the screen for their projection. You can take the work of the cross and apply it to that bitterness. And somehow it makes it sweet. May not be as instantaneous as Mara. It may not feel good. But follow the path of health, not the path of hatred. Apply the cross. If you're here today, apply the cross. If it's a real struggle for you today, apply the cross. If someone, if there's someone in this world who would love 
for your life to fall apart. Apply the cross. Amen? Amen. I want you to bow your heads with me really quick today.